Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist, Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hey everyone, I have some important information to share with you before this bonus episode on food waste. First of all, I hope that you are staying healthy and staying sane during this crazy new pandemic world that we are living in. I've been gathering some resources and compiling them to share with you about coronavirus disease related to food, nutrition, and health. Everything from stocking up your kitchen, trying to eat healthy and keep up with basic self-care, such as getting some exercise and getting adequate sleep, to making sure that you have enough prescription and over-the-counter medications and supplies, and also to be aware of scams involving false claims about foods and supplements that can cure or prevent the disease. You know, those immune-boosting claims that go beyond just normal, healthy eating recommendations. As a dietitian, I'm especially concerned about those who are food insecure or at risk of food insecurity. So I have some information about food assistance programs and ask that if you are in a position to help those in need, that you please do so by donating food or money or time if it's possible to volunteer, but still keep social distancing in mind. And as a diabetes care and education specialist, I'm also concerned about people with diabetes. They are not at greater risk of contracting COVID-19, but they are far more likely to face serious complications and even death from this disease. Medications, supplies, and sick day management are incredibly important at this time. So I realize there's a lot of information out there right now, and everyone is feeling overwhelmed and bombarded. But if you're looking for any information related to the topics or issues that I've mentioned, please go to soundbitesrd.com slash blog, and you'll find links to articles, videos, and other resources from some of my dietitian colleagues, from the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, and from the CDC. So with that, I just want to say, take care, stay healthy, and I hope you enjoy this bonus episode on food waste. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on this show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And this is a bonus episode in honor of March being National Nutrition Month and it's also National Agriculture Month. How cool is that? So I'm teaming up with the Food Bullying Podcast to discuss two important topics, food waste and food insecurity. We'll talk about food insecurity on the Food Bullying Podcast, but on this show today, we are going to dive into food waste. So the Food Bullying Podcast hosts are Michelle Payne and Eliz Green. You may be familiar with Michelle. She's been on the Soundbites podcast twice already. But she is known as one of the leading voices in connecting farm and food and bringing common sense to the overly emotional food conversation. Michelle is a mom who is tired of the guilt trips around food, so she wrote Food Bullying, How to Avoid Buying BS. And she's also the author of No More Food Fights and Food Truths from Farm to Table. Now, Eliz survived a heart attack at the age of 35 while she was seven months pregnant with twins which motivated her to share her story to inspire other busy people to pay attention to their health. As a professional speaker, she shares down-to-earth strategies on wellness, leadership, and stress management. She writes a top health and wellness blog and has also authored Stress Proof Your Heart and Busy Women's Guide to a Healthy Heart. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Hello. So this is a topic that we all feel pretty deeply about. This is a really important issue that is getting a lot of airtime these days. And we wanted to talk about it from a nutrition and agriculture standpoint. So I'd like to just start off by saying that some estimates show that one third of all the food produced never gets eaten. And a large portion of that goes into landfills, where it emits potent greenhouse gases. Each year, the average family wastes about 
$1,500 in food. And also what's interesting is consumers don't realize this, but they're actually the number one culprit. Households are responsible for over 40% of the food that's wasted. So I think there's a lot of finger pointing going on and they don't realize that they're making such a big impact. I agree. And before we started recording, I was saying I cleaned out my refrigerator this weekend as we tend to do. And I'm sort of disgusted by the amount of food I end up throwing out. And I probably should be able to be doing better, but it's it's a challenge. Yeah, I think awareness is a big part of it. And so, you know, these types of conversations are bringing more awareness to it. A little later, you know, we've got some resources and tips for people, but I actually did a 30-day food waste challenge and I learned a lot about what was going on in my home. Do you know what some of the most frequently wasted foods are or what did you see when you were cleaning out your fridge this weekend? Leftovers. So I am not good. I know I should probably put them in the freezer or do something different with them, but that is the thing that I throw out the most. And then probably dairy is the thing that I get the most worried about. Yeah. And for our listeners, that's Eliz talking. You'll get uh, familiar with our different voices. But yeah, so dairy products and vegetables make up almost 40% of the food wasted. And I'm with you. Leftovers, that is something that we often don't think about. It comes home with us a lot of the times, which is good. But then we were kind of tired of eating the same old thing and we want a little variety. And then, oops, I should have put that in the freezer and now it's too late. What about you, Michelle? What do you see in your house? The vegetable graveyard is a very real thing. (laughs) But I have to say that we have a new refrigerator. And the refrigerator, my husband and I were just talking last night, it seems to have reduced our food waste, excuse me, our food waste, because we can see everything now. I actually had a refrigerator, believe it or not, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but it froze all produce and anything in its bottom half mm. for about five years. Our refrigerator was a disaster, and now we have a double wide French door. It's fabulous. Mm. But vegetables are the ones. We do a decent job on leftovers because I live 20 miles from the closest grocery store. And so when I actually take the time to prepare the food, I want to make sure that it's eaten and we have a lot of freezer space. But I think that you're absolutely on the right track, Melissa, because one of the things that I wrote about in my second book, Food Truths from Farm to Table, was that the answer to food waste is hidden in your refrigerator. And so many people don't realize that if they really want to do something about um, our environment and landfills, that food is a huge part of it. It is the single largest contributor to landfills today. And it's amazing when you look at 133 billion pounds of food in dumpsters. Mm. And I I know that we're also talking about food insecurity on the Food Bullying Podcast and our joint Agriculture Month, Dietitian Month venture here. But I think it's important to note that I feel guilty personally when I throw away food. And I do, to be clear, Mm -hmm. again, the vegetable graveyard is very real, Mm -hmm. but it's it makes me feel terrible when I realize that there's people out there that need food. Yeah, I hear you. My refrigerator and I have a complicated relationship um, <laughs> and it's very frustrating, <laughs> but uh, I try to appreciate it. But yeah, it, I always say that the crisper drawer is where vegetables go to get forgotten and get rotten. But to your point, when we throw away food and I always say, you know, it's not just you're throwing cash in the trash. If we could get more people to make that connection that that food goes into the landfill and contributes such a large portion to greenhouse gases. And we all want to do our part to improve climate change and make our planet healthier. And again, if we're not realizing that we are wasting food and that it does contribute to climate change, that that I think awareness is the first step. But I mean, there's a lot of reasons we waste food. And Mm -hmm. when I did the 30-day food waste challenge, I realized that I was purchasing too much fresh produce. And we just couldn't possibly eat it all, even when I was trying to be very thoughtful and shop my refrigerator before I went to the store and see what I needed to kind of use up before it went bad. I realized, gosh, we just can't eat that much salad or that much fresh produce. The question is, but you know, you don't want to run out. And that's where I was more diligent about supplementing with my pantry and my freezer. And that's what we encourage people to do to cut costs anyway. So that's the nice thing about increasing awareness about food waste is it it is a nice way to kind of 
tie everything up together that makes sense with regard to meal planning and trying to get more nutrition in your meals, but eating healthy on a budget, it kind of all works together. I think it's hard to when you go to the store and you're making a recipe, for example, that takes a smaller amount of produce than the size that you can buy. Mm -hmm. It depends on the store too. I went to a lower cost grocery store trying it out and needed, for example, lemons for a recipe. And I really only needed two lemons, but they didn't have individual lemons. They only had them by the bag. Mm -hmm. So now I have six lemons sitting on my counter rotting. (laughs) (laughs) And the smart thing would be to make something else with lemons, but that takes planning and it makes it difficult. And I've found that one of the things that has helped me cut down on the on the amount of things I'm bringing into the house and then having to throw away is shopping somewhere where I can buy a smaller amount of whatever I need. Mm -hmm. That's not always possible. And it would be, again, smart to plan ahead. And the other thing that I struggle with is I don't want to throw particularly produce into the garbage, into a plastic bag that now goes to the landfill. And we experimented our house with doing some composting, I will admit I am not great at that. And I also wonder about, I have a disposal. Is that a decent thing to do with my leftover rotting produce? Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder that too. We actually have a composting service in our community that has been on my to-do list to just kind of take that final step. My son kept bringing it up, my 11-year-old son, we should compost, we should compost. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. We should, but oh my gosh, I just wouldn't even know where to start. And we already have like a skunk infestation in our community. Isn't that just going to make it worse? Like, don't even get me started. (laughs) But then I noticed that we do have this service in our community. So it's really seems, I I haven't tried it yet, but I'm planning to, but it seems really simple. They bring you the bucket and you use it all week and then they come next week and they take your old bucket and they give you a new one. So it seems like a really great service. I know that's not available everywhere and not everybody has the means to do that, but we do. So I'm going to definitely check that out. You know, Michelle, you know, with your food bullying book, I know when I had you on the show before, we were talking a lot about food labels. And so I wanted you to chime in about, because one of the reasons for food waste is a lot of consumers are confused about label dates and best buy dates. And we're afraid, well, it's bad, I should throw it out because I don't want to get sick. So talk to us about that, Michelle. Yeah, it's interesting what all of the studies show is that people are discarding food at quantities that they actually don't need to. So one of the recommendations from the government is to change the dates. And believe it or not, it is not regulated, just to make sure everyone is clear. But the recommendation from USDA and the Food Safety Information Service is to use the best if used by date because supposedly it conveys to consumers that the product will be of the best quality if it's used by the calendar date shown. But it's also noted that if food doesn't show any sign of spoilage, that it's probably okay to eat, um, even beyond that best if used by date. And some of the studies show that people um, are most likely to throw out meats that they are concerned that are expired, which is really interesting because I know I don't know a lot of people that eat raw meat. And <laughs> if you cook it right, you don't have nearly as many concerns. Now, I would never recommend that you cook meat that is two weeks past its best if used by date and has not been frozen. But a trick that we do, because again, it's just out of time management and being able to have food readily available in the country is our meat lives in the freezer Mm -hmm. until a couple of days before we're going to cook it. So our expiration dates, as most people call them, actually are well beyond, but it's been frozen. Mm -hmm. But just as a reminder, everyone, um, cooking meat, Liz, what do you have to use? A meat thermometer. I personally enjoy the digital meat thermometer. Ding, 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 ding. You win a prize. (laughs) (laughs) She does. Yay. She didn't fall prey to the food bullies. Mm Mm-hmm. So just for everyone's reference, you're supposed to cook your chicken to um, 165 degrees, roast and steak to 145 degrees, uh, ground meat to 160, and fish to 145. And a great resource 
is fightback.org. So that's F-I-G-H-T-B-A-C.org for other food safety tips. But the same study also showed that people are likely to keep their soft cheeses, which actually have a much higher food safety risk when they've been kept for too long. So I would just advise to always give your food the sniff test and the eyeball to see if, it, and the, the other one, and there's no scientific proof on this, but Melissa, maybe you as an RD and have a perspective, but I always check meat, especially for the slime factor. Yeah, I think it gets a little scary with some of the, the fresh foods. Um, I actually have a, a kind of embarrassing but kind of funny story about, you mentioned the cheeses. I was doing the food waste challenge. And so I was really trying to be diligent about using up what was in my fridge. So I had some shredded cheese that hadn't been opened yet, but there was a little mold in there. And that should have been a red flag for me because obviously something wrong happened in the processing and the packaging. But I'm like, oh, it's just a little bit of mold, which I didn't notice till I opened it. But I had already you know, bought some tortillas to use up this extra cheese. And I said, okay, it was mozzarella, I think. And, you know, I picked out the moldy parts of cheese and I made the, the quesadillas and mm, they kind of tasted like blue cheese quesadillas. And I was like, that's not the result I was looking for. And so that, you know, I kind of crossed the line there a little bit. And I said, OK, I need to dial it back because this isn't this is not a good idea. But yeah, people are afraid of getting sick. But those best buy dates are for quality, not for food safety. And in most cases, like you said, the sniff test, you can tell if a food has gone beyond that date and you want to see if it still is good quality, you usually can tell by the way it looks, smells, the texture, the touch. That's different from what we see with foodborne illness, where the food looks perfectly fine, tastes perfectly fine, but then you get very sick from it. This is different, although there are some products that like the moldy cheese, which you know could transition over into being a food safety issue. But I think that that's one of the things that people are confused and a little fearful about. I mean, nobody wants to get sick. But for the most part, you know, if it's like cereal or crackers or a canned item is going to last forever unless it's dented or bulged. And you can tell when you eat the cracker, well, yeah, okay, this is a little stale or it's gone a little rancid, you know, you can tell and you don't eat the rest of it. Right. A lot of this reminds me of when I worked in the state extension office in Missouri in graduate school. You know, now we have all these digital resources, but back in the day, we just had these charts that we would look at, you know, how long is this food good in the refrigerator? How long is it good in the freezer? Which, Michelle, you mentioned, you know, your meat lives in the freezer until it needs to be thawed for use. And that's one of the tips that we want to share with the listeners is that proper food storage can really help keep the quality and safety of your food for a longer period of time. And there are some apps and tips that we're going to share and resources that we're going to share regarding that. Yeah. And I think one of the things a lot of people are confused about is where they can find more information about their food, because the processing codes are often done with Julian dating, which is its own special language in itself. So again, look for that best if used by date. And if you want to learn more about the processing of your food, eggs, for example, the packing date is right after the processing plant number. Do you both know how to tell if an egg is bad? No. No. Basically, you just put it in water. And if it floats, then you shouldn't use it. Oh, if it floats, you should not use it. Okay, good to know. But again, you can look for the packing date, which is what you want to know, because eggs stay good for quite some time after the processing plant number. Meat and poultry uh, actually has a USDA MPI app, so look for that. For milk, you can look for where is my milk from as far as the website. And then if you're really into it, you can look at the Code of Federal Regulations at ecfr.gov. That's really technical, but there are a lot of different places for you to find more information rather than just throwing away food. And and I want to echo what Melissa said as far as the value of nutrition and canned and frozen produce in particular. There is nothing wrong with buying uh, food in cans and in frozen packages. In fact, if it's going to allow your family to have nutrition more readily, by all means do that. And if it helps you reduce your food waste in the process, that's a double win. Mm -hmm. It's actually, yeah, you got the trifecta. You have it saves you money. It gives you more nutrition or, you know, then less nutrient rich foods. 
and it reduces food waste and the impact on the environment. Another great resource is savethefood.com. There's really great information there, but there's also this really cute video about the life of a strawberry that I'll put in the links in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But this little girl begs the mom to buy this carton of strawberries and it gets home, it gets in the fridge, it gets pushed to the back, it gets rotten. Poor strawberry. Yeah, it grows hair and it ends up in the garbage. And it's just, it's really a touching video. And there's also foodsafety.gov has some information. Of, it's in their Food Keeper app. There's an app for that. There's also a great food waste toolkit that a colleague of mine uh, and friend dietitian Leslie Bonsi created for General Mills. I will link to that. It's got like week by week tips to help you kind of get into that awareness and uh, making some some changes in your own home. And I also interviewed my colleague, Joan Salji Blake, on the podcast. It's episode number 103. It's called Talking Trash. There's a lot of great information there if people want that. You know, I was going to ask you, Michelle, too, you know, since we're doing this in collaboration with Nutrition Month and Agriculture Month, I'd love for you to speak to the farmers and how they contribute to cutting down on food waste before we wrap up. You know, there's a lot of amazing stories out there about food production and how waste has been uh, decreased. For example, our mutual friend, I think Jenny Schmidt out in Maryland, shared a story with me about how some of her green beans did not meet specs to the people that she was selling them to. And so they actually ended up donating them to a local food bank. I have numerous examples of farmers doing that across the country, but probably one of the coolest stories that a lot of people don't know, and the two of you might enjoy, is did you know that cows actually can be amazing recyclers that help prevent food waste? Mm, That's true. Tell us, uh, give us a little bit more about that. So dairy cattle have a very refined diet. Their diets are actually evaluated on more points of nutrition than human diets are. They have their own dietitians. They're called ruminant nutritionists, and their rations or their diets are literally looked at nearly every week. And if a dairy farm lives near a food processing site or perhaps near a retail distribution center, it's not uncommon for the cows to be fed scraps of food. So cows may be getting leftover chocolate, leftover donuts. They love holes of nuts, believe it or not. They also um, enjoy the sweet side and of leftover donuts and whatnot. And I actually have a few friends that feed their dairy cattle very unusual things in the interest of saving money, providing nutrition, and cutting down food waste. So as you said, Melissa, it's really the trifecta. And you don't need to worry. There's no negative effect to the milk or, of course, the cow because dairy farmers would never be feeding their cows leftover chocolate. And no, it does not make chocolate milk. (laughs) But it's a really cool story of recycling, I think, or upcycling. You can put whatever term you want on it. But it's important to know that farmers are out there working really hard to try to reduce food waste in a, a lot of different ways. Thank you. Yes. And that ties into farming efficiency and sustainability. It all goes hand in hand. So thank you for sharing those specific examples. And you know, for everybody listening, we can't blame the farmers in the grocery stores when such a large portion comes from our own homes. So hopefully this awareness will be helpful. And dietitians every day, we're on the front lines helping people with all of this that ties together again with shopping on a budget, simple cooking tips, maybe getting a little creative with leftovers and how to increase nutrition while decreasing food waste and saving money. So It's really important, and there's no downside to it. It is win-win-win. Absolutely. Fantastic. Is there anything else you guys wanted to share before we wrap up? Food bullying. I food bully myself all of the time. I think just giving ourselves permission to think through what we're doing and not overreact to something that is past a date in the refrigerator, doing a little investigation. Yeah. Yeah, and just use common sense. And not only the foods you select, but also giving yourself permission, as Liz said, to know that you are doing the right thing. And we all have a vegetable rot in the vegetable graveyard. It's okay. Just try to do better next week. That's right. So I'll just recap some of the tips. Shop your kitchen before you shop the store. Do a little basic meal planning. It doesn't have to be that in depth, but kind of see what you have and what you want to use up before it goes bad. Read those labels and then... As Michelle said, look at the food. Does it pass the sniff test? You know, how does it look and smell? And really 
getting some proper storage practices in your home can really help keep the food safe and good quality longer, such as getting it into the freezer, putting a date on it, and things like that. You know, we talked about composting a little bit. See if there are any services in your area or if there's something that you can learn how to DIY it. And uh, we've got all these great resources for you. And I'll have links in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. So thank you so much for tuning into this bonus episode. Thank you, Liz and Michelle, for being on the show. And of course, I encourage everybody to check out the Food Bullying Podcast if you have not yet. Liz, I just want to say thank you on behalf of everyone in agriculture for being a dietitian that cares about the entire journey of food and cares about connecting with farmers, because that's really why I wanted to do the joint celebration with you is because you're one of those great dietitians that not only knows science, but you're always interested in the journey that food takes. Just wanted to say thank you and wish you a very happy National Nutrition Month. Well, thank you so much. That was very sweet. I appreciate it. And the work you do is very important as well. And happy Agricultural Month to you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke. Produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts.